Episode 1. Definitions. I strongly identify with the ground-up philosophy of teaching a subject. It is best to not leave anything to assumption or chance and cover every detail possible and expand upon these small building blocks until larger structures can be made. So this video will deal strictly with 12-tone theory so that we can divide and complexify in the future. For those of you who have a lot of knowledge about music theory, this will likely be all review, and of course, you're welcome to skip it, but who knows, maybe you'll learn something new here. In Western classical music, sound is organized on a staff spatially. Dots can be placed on the staff up and down to notate pitch, such as high and low, and as well the shape of the dot, as well as modifiers put onto it notate how long the note ought to be played for. Notes placed on the staff by themselves correspond to the white keys of the piano, and each of these white keys are given one of seven letter names, which repeat themselves theoretically infinitely. The lowest white key on the piano is called A, the next B, and so on, continuing until G is played, which is followed by another A. There is no H in our music, but instead we have these cycles of A through G, A through G, etc., if you listen closely, you'll hear that every one of these repeated pitches have a very similar sound to each other relative to the notes around them. We would say that these similar notes are an octave apart. For example, this G is one octave higher than this G. As you can see, of course, there are more than just white keys on a keyboard. There are, in five cases, pitches that are in between the white keys all of which have two names. If you want to move from, say, a C to the black key directly to the right of it, you add a sharp to the front of the note, and this black key is called C sharp. Likewise, you can arrive at a black key moving downward, flatting a note. So this black key could also be called D flat. Generally, sharp means move up one semitone or half step and flat means the opposite. If you want to go back to a white key from a black one, you can use a natural symbol. All of these symbols collectively are called accidentals. Sharps can go on any note, however, not just C, D, E, G, or A. And as well, F and C can be flatted. So B sharp is enharmonic, meaning it has the different name for the same sound with C natural. F flat is enharmonic with E natural. By this rule, every key on the keyboard really has several names, and being intimately aware of how the rules affect different pitches is important to being sure that you don't accidentally play a wrong note somewhere along the way. While not terribly common, there are even double accidentals, double flat and double sharp, which mean you move an additional step in that direction. So, G double flat is enharmonic with F natural. B double sharp is enharmonic with C sharp. When we get more into quarter tone accidentals, you'll begin seeing the double accidentals used more often because they provide a sort of barrier for the accidentals that we commonly use. Let's talk intervals now. An interval in music theory is the measurable distance between two notes on a staff. Interval names have two parts, the general distance and the specific quality. First, a look at distance. When finding an interval, one begins with the start pitch and counts until they reach the end pitch. For instance, on this staff, there is a note on the bottom line followed by a note on the bottom space. The bottom line is one, counting up until the goal is reached at two. So we would call this interval a second. Thirds look like a line jumping to another line, or a space to a space, with one note in between them. Fourths look like a second, except there's also another space or line sandwiched between the notes. Fifths jump two lines or spaces, etc. Intervals can theoretically go on forever, and you could have a 78th or 150th interval if you wanted, although notation would probably get a bit taxing at such extremes. The important takeaway about the first part of an interval is that it deals strictly with distance on a staff, not the sound of the pitch itself. We're going to discover that there are many enharmonic intervals, meaning that while they look different, they sound the same. 
just like with pitches themselves. So before you try working out the quality of an interval, always be sure to measure its distance first. Interval quality refers to the more refined tone that an interval makes up, or how many semitones wide the interval is exactly. The fundamental interval qualities are built by following a major scale. Let's use a C major scale to build these intervals. C to the same C is a perfect interval. That means it has no emotional quality to it. It's just a sterile sound. There's no beating. So if two notes are the exact same as each other, this distance is called a perfect unison, which is notated on the page as P1. Note that the P is capitalized. C to D is two semitones apart and is called a major second, notated as capital M2. C to E is four semitones apart. It's called a major third. Next, we have C to F, another perfect interval, so a perfect fourth, or P4. C to G is a perfect fifth. C to A does have an emotional quality to it, but that's kind of an odd way of putting it. We would call it a major sixth, or an M6, with a capital M. C to B is called a major seventh. Finally, C to C, an octave higher, is called a perfect octave, or a P8. If you play any major scale in the universe, these same intervals will be observed in them. All of these can be expanded or contracted while still maintaining their intervallic distance, but there are two different classes of interval present here, and thus they are nominally altered differently. Let's begin with the perfect intervals, unison, fourth, fifth, and octave. To make this kind of interval larger, in other words, to sharpen the goal pitch, is to augment it, which is notated with a capital A before the interval number. So a C to a C sharp on the same line is called an augmented unison, or a capital A1. C to G sharp is an augmented fifth. To flatten the goal pitch of a perfect interval is to diminish the interval, notated with a lowercase d. C to F flat is a diminished fourth. C to C flat an octave higher is a diminished octave. You may notice that a diminished fourth is enharmonic with a major third. They use different pitches to notate, but they sound identical. Be mindful of this and do your best to avoid the fallacy of claiming that these intervals are the same, and not two different paths to the same destination. The need to differentiate between enharmonic intervals will become clearer with time, I promise. The other class of intervals, 2nd, 3rd, 6th, and 7th, are altered differently and have different names for their alterations. Let's begin by lowering them. To flatten one of these intervals is to render it a minor interval, which is notated with a lowercase m, to tell it apart from a major uppercase m. In handwritten work, it sometimes is useful to put a dash over your lowercase m if it isn't easy to tell the difference in your handwriting. So we have a minor second, minor third, minor sixth, and a minor seventh. Compare this to the flatted perfect intervals, which are called diminished. There is no minor fourth or major octave. And if you try to claim something as a minor fifth in your theory homework, you're going to get a big red F stamped on your forehead. So for the second class intervals we were just discussing, diminished actually is used for lowering it twice, not once as with first class perfect intervals. So a C to a D double flat is called a diminished second. C to B double flat is a diminished seventh, etc. Sharping a second class interval is to augment it. So theoretically, there isn't really a way of calling a doubly sharped second class interval, like a C to an E double sharp, except perhaps something ham-fisted like a doubly augmented third. But the rarity of such intervals really negates the need for terms like these. At any rate, C to D sharp is an augmented second, C to A sharp is an augmented sixth, etc. There's no way of naming doubly altered first class intervals like a C to an F double flat, but again, these are so rare, it's a moot point. So, by looking at this, you can see that there is a lot to internalize about figuring intervals on the fly. And being able to differentiate intervals that are seemingly unrelated to each other is important to being able to understand the far more complex and nuanced interval types that will be expounded upon in episode 2. 
I've included on the screen a chart of the interval distances and what they could be called theoretically, and that chart will also be included in the description for you to study with. If you feel you're ready for it, why don't you try looking at these intervals I'm going to display and figure out what they are. You'll have five seconds to look and then I'll show the answers, but feel free to pause and try to work it out if you need more time. I think the last fundamental that should be covered here is the issue of notating intervals on a scale. When you're dealing with scales, major second and minor second are used less often than whole step and half step, which can be the same thing, but not necessarily so. Look at C to D half lap. It's a half step as well as a minor second. A C to C sharp, however, is a half step but an augmented unison. So whole and half step are used for notating the distances between pitches in a scale. Whole steps are notated with a curved line connecting the note heads, like so. And half steps are notated with a crooked line that resembles a V, like this. Here is a D major scale notated with its step sizes. All major scales follow this rule of whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. So if you ever want to figure out how to write any major scale, try using that model to build it and it should theoretically be correct. Take a look at these scalar steps and try to figure out whether they're a whole step with a curved line or a half step with a jagged line. Be careful, however, I threw in a couple curveballs. If this episode has made any sense to you and you feel that you can replicate the various parts of it without difficulty, then I would say you're ready to continue to episode 2, where I will introduce some aspects of 24-tone music theory and how it relates to traditional 12-tone theory. If this lesson is confusing, however, and you do not feel like it makes sense, perhaps you should have a bit more training before attempting this series, which will delve into far more difficult content than this. I might sometime make a Fundamental of Theory series as well, which will go into more detail about the topics I've covered in this lesson, but this video itself was built to be a preliminary lesson to be sure that you are up to date on the core basics before diving into the deep end, and not as a formal introductory theory lesson. If you have any questions, feel free to post your concerns in the comment section, and I will try to answer them as best I can. Otherwise, I'll see you in episode 2.